Caregivers and professionals who support Alzheimer's patients have a chance to learn new skills through the beauty of poetry and rhythm. Find out why juvenile detention isn't only about incarceration of our troubled youth. And adult offenders on the verge of release prepare for a big dose of family reunification. The forum begins right now. I'm Jan Callahan. Imagine sharing the joy and healing power of the arts with people who have special needs and who are isolated from society. Tidewater Arts Outreach is an organization that has and, has and continues to do just that. And I'm pleased to welcome Creative Services Directors Julie Clark and Emily McKenna, who are performing artists in their own right, and they're also board members, of course, uh, with an organization that is just doing wonderful things in the community and, uh, and some wonderful things that we want you to know more about. So th thank you for coming to share. Thank you Thank so much you. for inviting us. Mm -hmm. Tidewater Arts Organization uh, Outreach has um, been in existence for how long? Ten years now. Wow, mm -hmm. ten years. It's okay. flown by. <laughs> yes, ten, mm -hmm. ten years. Mm -hmm. And in that time, uh, a big facet of our mission is to educate the community about how important it is to that the benefits of arts experiences mm -hmm. and how important they are and the impact that they impact um, a lot more than just quality of life, but they actually impact wellness and health. Um, in all the different populations that we serve. So mm -hmm. in 10 years time, I think we've ma we're making headway mm -hmm. with people understanding um, the, the need for, our, for these services. Okay, so having artists come together, s essentially, to provide this kind of experience mm -hmm. for people um, who may not otherwise be able to get out and listen to it, or maybe have never experienced a certain type of art that, um, that these artists are sharing with them is, has got to be um, just a, Enlightening as well as enlivening to people who it maybe is. haven't had much stimulation mm -hmm. in a while, or think that maybe there's just not more. That's to exactly apply. right. That's exactly right. Our we um, survey for for quality and you know continual improvement, and we hear the most. They're so valued. These programs are mm -hmm. you know it just makes people's whole month to have these experiences. And you're right that some of them may have never experienced. That particular art form mm -hmm. before, and they're certainly at um, at a limited. They have limited access. That's the mm -hmm. whole point of why TAO is bringing arts experiences to them. Mm -hmm. Is that and and they really it's tremendously valued and and it has a real impact. The that you bring this to nursing homes, you you mm -hmm. bring it to um, crisis um, shelters, and what have you, and shelters as well, rehab okay. facilities, hospitals, wow. um, children. You know, it's ch from children's people hospital. Of all ages, yes, yeah. people of all ages, mm -hmm. very much. Wow. Very much, and this particular um, project focuses on the seniors that we serve, which comprise about seventy percent mm -hmm. of the programs that we present are for seniors. Okay, um, it's particularly hard for them to get out and and have arts experiences. Mm -hmm. So, um, so this this particular workshop that we're telling everyone about today mm -hmm. is um, is to support seniors. Okay, and this particular project that's coming up, which will be in January. Uh huh. Um, is a workshop, and it's yep. for um, caregivers and professionals who are involved with people with all Alzheimer's, as well as family members. Family members, mm -hmm. so and artists. it's not an yeah. artist. Okay, so you've so got <laughs> you're all inclusive, and, uh -huh. and yeah. So when you say workshop, it's not like well, you have to have this, you know, specific connection and credentials. Uh -huh. This is something that you can everybody can learn from. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. And everyone's welcome. Uh -huh. So what is it that, the, it's called the Alzheimer's Poetry Project, and uh -huh. this is a, this is, was devised and created by someone who is going to be facil uh, teaching or training? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Facilitators? Okay. Gary Glasner is his name, and uh -huh. he, um, he's a poet himself. Okay. And so he, he started this 10 years ago and, and kind of recognized that when he um, would use poetry when working with people living with uh, dementia, that there was a spark, there was something that engaged them. And it, it's not just um, reading the poetry that he'll be um, actually teaching the facilitators to do. He'll, he'll um, show how you can use rhythm and movement and um, actually um, physical touch, hand, like holding their hand, having them feel the rhythm of the poetry is, is how he engages um, with 
with people um, that are living with dementia yeah. to elicit um, a part of them that they haven't, that has been maybe quieted down, yeah. that comes Muted alive. A bit. And yeah. yeah, being able to reach out and get all, get all those senses involved, mm -hmm. not just the one that they may have that's fairly active but may right. not be as meaningful unless you put it all yeah giving them different layers mm -hmm. yeah so exactly. that's uh and so he's been doing it for 10 years and clearly uh -huh. it must be well received because he's still doing it and yeah. now um being able to to teach others how to be able to kind of tune into that right that wavelength and and, and help those people who may live in the moment mm -hmm. at least have the best moments they can very much right mm -hmm. very much. yeah so the workshop itself, mm -hmm. what does it entail, and when is it yeah. for one thing? Yeah, that's but, you know. very important. Yes, yeah, um, so we would like to let people know. <laughs> it's January 22nd, okay, and it's taking place at the Memory Center, mm -hmm. um, and um, the uh, time is from 9 a.m. to 2:30, okay. um, and so it's uh, the cost of it. If anybody is interested, is it's forty dollars for um, general um, participation. We also have a discounted rate of twenty for active duty and students with um, a valid ID. Okay, so we've got forty dollars or twenty dollars mm -hmm. for the active duty and, and students, which is yeah. great. So this really does invite a lot of people into experience what this can be like and be able to share it, yeah. Um, yes. share it with others, yeah. because they're learning how to how to do this exactly. and, and how to bring it out. Wow, mm -hmm. that's that's got to be very uh, powerful for yeah. people to discover a new aspect of oh, of the arts because it is a very different way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Very much so, and it's also um, especially accessible because we've we've received some support for this training from the Virginia Commission mm -hmm. for the Arts, right. and um, and also from the Memory Center, which is yeah. located in Virginia Beach. Mm -hmm. So um, for folks that would like to take you know two thirds of a day and and learn some new skills. Um, whether it's just connecting with a family member that they mm -hmm. love, really um, learning some new skills for that, or whether they'd like to to bring that skill to you know to the senior population more formally, uh -huh. you know that that um, yeah. there's there's going to be room to accommodate all all of those who are interested in it. It's a reduced registration fee because of the generous support, yeah. um, f you know that we've received from the Virginia Commission of, for the Arts in particular. Yeah. We had hoped to show a video, but we weren't able to get it in time. But there's a uh, there was one that showed a person tap dancing. Mm -hmm. um, and you d I, first I looked at it and I'm like, I'm not really sure what this is about. Uh -huh. And then I heard the poetry being um, read and the rhythm and how it all connected. Yeah. And the people that were there were people that were suffering from d a dementia of some sort and were responsive to mm -hmm. this and were picking up on the, because it was a familiar um, poem. Right. And uh, they would start chiming in and you could see people moving and it's very very um, you know captivating when you when you're watching stuff like that because you wonder why is this guy tap dancing at first and <laughs> oh he's really good too <laughs> right. and you were explaining that that Gary Glasner's approach that he's going to be teaching in this yeah. workshop is multimodal that right. it, uh -huh. you know you kind of try to reach out in very in different mm -hmm. in different ways and connect on a lot of different levels yeah. and so it's kind of surprising <laughs> that that would work as effectively yeah. as it does uh -huh. but you see people tapping their you know tapping their toes and it's it's like to open the eyes of people who are potentially facilitating this about how mm -hmm. they can connect it's mm -hmm. not an easy population necessarily mm -hmm. to connect with so the skills for for mm -hmm. how how to how to get through you know people who are maybe a little closed closed in mm -hmm. how to really do that effectively and apparently you know there are all kinds of ways that are a little bit unexpected yeah <laughs> well, let's have the fun mm -hmm. of learning yeah. and um, you know it may be uh, great that, the, that uh, people can come in there and come away with something that they too have learned that's new and may mm -hmm. even alter the way they look at life and, and certainly help them right. better deal with some of the ravages of the disease because it's such a dreadful thing for people to have to go through family members too it is. Um, and and to to have um, a way to to use mm -hmm. what's around them to make it a little better for everybody they must benefit yeah. it's gonna be really cool yeah so let's repeat again when it's going to be yeah. so people will know about it it's, it's January 22nd uh -huh. um, and it's during the day 9 to, to 2 30 at the Memory Center in mm -hmm. Virginia Beach okay. $40 for general uh, uh, ticket um, 
and that includes coffee and lunch. Um, oh, and nice. another thing I like to mention is that if you are a healthcare professional um, and you need CEUs, um, there will be um, about I think it's 4.5 CEUs for this this training, okay, and it's good. 15 dollars extra for that. All right, that's always good to know. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I, I wish we could talk more and more, yeah. and I hope that people will be responsive okay. and go to this. Do I have just a moment to chime in that anyone who's interested in registering for registering for um, the workshop can do that through our website, which mm -hmm. is tidewaterartsoutreach.org, mm -hmm. and also you know our agency to make this good work happen in the community. Mm -hmm. we, we rely on public support, mm -hmm. so you know you could register for to participate in the workshop, or just or just sign up to to um, make a donation to TAO okay. through tidewaterartsoutreach.org. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right, appreciate you coming in and sharing the good news. Well, juvenile detention. If you mentioned that. That phrase, you may think incarceration, but the work being done by staff at the Norfolk Juvenile Detention Center is moving toward a much brighter and positive goal. We'll be right back. Every day across America, excess food is gathered by a network of good people at local food banks, giving hope to millions of children who struggle with hunger. They've earned their wings, and you can too. Together, we can solve child hunger. Support Feeding America and your local food bank at feedingamerica.org. Juvenile offenders are often lumped into one category, but the children, yes, children, who enter the detention facility arrive there for a variety of reasons, and not all of them need to be there or stay there. Please welcome David Robinson. He's a security counselor who has gained a lot of wisdom through his many years of working with troubled youth, and he joins us today to talk about what the detention center does and what it is also doing outside the walls of the facility and um, that that is a, a hugely important part of uh, working with today's youth to ensure that they don't go back. That's correct. Yes. Thank you for having me. Um, first of all we serve three particular populations. We have a pre D population which is uh, residents that stay approximately 30 days until they've been adjudicated. Mm -hmm. We have an outreach component which essentially provides electronic monitoring and other services to kids while they remain in the community. And it's usually that first point of contact where they start to receive some kind of services and assessments. And then hopefully what will happen is that there will be a coordination of services to minimize any reoccurrence or recidivism. The final service we offer is a post-D program, which I lead. And it's for children who have been sentenced to uh, confinement within that facility for a period of six months. And during that time frame, we work from the premise that a lot of behavior is not uh, criminal in nature so much as it is an uh, act of not knowing any other alternatives. So we begin teaching social skill sets. Um, we teach behavior patterns. We monitor those. And uh, basically, we teach some skills, uh, entry-level uh, vocational skills and we've just started that program until they've been adjudicated finally finished their sentence so there are many things that we may take for granted that some children really don't have exposure to before they've actually gotten into the facility or they haven't learned them or applied them to their lives uh, within the last decade there's been a tremendous amount of research done about the science of adolescence development and what most uh, research agrees upon is that the adolescent brain is not fully developed or is able uh, to consistently do higher level cognitive and executive functions until the age of 21 or 25. 
So prior to that time, it becomes real contingent that we provide them with enough exposure, uh, enough alternatives, so that they can make sound and rational decisions when they reach that, that age. And that's primarily what we strive to do in the post D program. Okay, so it's to help guide them through what can be a really rocky period for any kid, but it can be particularly rocky for them. So you want to make sure that they have the tools they need in order to make better decisions. That's correct. And, and that's pretty much been a change. I've been in the field over 20 years now. And initially when I started out, it was merely incarceration. It was just control. You do your time, you get out. What we do know is that the vast percentage of juveniles we work with will be returning to the community. And unless we do something to minimize or correct behavior, they'll return to the communities and they'll still uh, perform some of the same acts that caused them initially to get in there. So um, the field now is moving in the direction of we want to do and provide some level of treatment so we can minimize the recurrence of any criminal behavior. Okay, so kind of breaking the cycle of that, exactly. that behavior exactly. by teaching them something new. So you, you work with them. Are there some specific things you do um, to work with these youth? Um, well, we work from a co cognitive behavior modality. Um, and it's based primarily on the premise that most behavior is done because of thinking errors. So we try to recorrect those thinking errors. But in addition, on the post D program, we have, uh, we require our residents to give back to the community um, through service learning projects. Okay. Previously, we've had a young lady who had constructed wigs for cancer patients. We've made numerous donations to food banks, Salvation Army, even to the Up Center's bookstore. So uh, by giving back to the community, we get them in the cycle of realizing that there are other people who have similar problems or problems that are worse than the ones they're experiencing. So life isn't really that bad. So we try to give them something to contrast and compare because regardless of how bad we think our life is, there is always somebody else who has conditions a little worse. Uh, the last major project we did uh, with the PD program, and, and uh, we had it in the newsletter, so we thank you. Um, families got involved in the process, and they sponsored through World Vision, um, providing a total of eight chickens for families in third world countries. And uh, what we explained to them during that time frame was that we were looking at making positive long-term changes. Uh, part of that was being working from that old adage that you can give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. If you teach him to fish, he can feed himself for a lifetime. So that was the premise we worked from. So uh, we give back to the community. We get them involved in doing positive things in the community, and that's one of the goals of the service learning projects. Yeah. And they can feel good about what they've done, too. Exactly. That's so important. Exactly. To feel that what you've done is valuable. Exactly. Yeah, that makes a big, big difference. There are a lot of different aspects to what is going uh, to what you do and how you work with with the youth and in, in detention. And we don't have time to talk about all of them now, but I hope that we can continue to we'd um, be happy to to, to focus on and some of the different aspects so that people really are aware. Of, um, there's a lot more that goes on um, in the juvenile detention facility than what you may assume is going on, and those mm -hmm. assumptions can be. Um, quite off, and that's why we want somebody like David um, to share his, his experience, because he's spent so many years um, doing what he does, but you know, the insight that he's also you know, obtained over, mm -hmm. over time, and sharing that with people on so-called the outside, you know, so that you know, you know. There are real human beings, and there are young people in there, and, and they do have some chances to and turn their lives around. That was one of the biggest observations we had made, because uh, when you work with them daily and you see them on Saturday morning looking at cartoons and eating cereal and doing the same thing that your family would do or neighborhood kids would do, you realize that they're still kids. Yeah. And sometimes because of the environment, sometimes because of maybe mental health reasons, because of um, parents didn't have a proper uh, super, supervisory pattern, they've got off track. Mm -hmm. But you see that they're still kids, they're still malleable, and so that's an opportunity for us to do what we do and to provide them with alternatives to look at, to once again, contrast and compare and decide upon what's a better course of action. So. David, thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. This for is a great us. way to start. We'll continue. Thank you.
And when we come back, we will talk to someone about our prisoner reentry program and adults who have been incarcerated, what's being help, uh, done to help their ex-offenders, the ex-offenders and their families to reunite and work together toward better lives for everyone. So don't go away. Measured in seats starts with the right ones early on. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Learn how to prevent deaths and injuries by using the right car seat for your child's age and size. Norfolk's prisoner reentry program has led the state in helping ex-offenders prepare to enter the mainstream again. And more and more, the focus has broadened to include the families as well. Janice Roach is a family services worker with Norfolk Human Services, and she's deeply involved in a program that strives to strengthen family bonds through consistent communication, which is the key to many, many, getting many things done. But when someone is coming out of prison, um, coming back into the mainstream, it's extremely important that they have some place and someone to go to. Um, as, um, as you said, we have a volunteer prisoner reentry program within mm -hmm. Norfolk Department of Human Services. And part of that program component is the family integration. It's mm -hmm. a process where we try to get the families more involved in their, uh, with their loved ones coming home, but we try to get involved with them while they're incarcerated prior to coming home so that we already have processes in place and referrals and resources in place for when they come home so that they can be more successful. It's, it's proven fact that family support is one of the most important um, successful tools uh, someone who's incarcerated needs to be successful when they come home. If they have family support and second of all they have employment they're on their way to be successful right out the gate. Yeah, well support is what it's all about because it's a scary transition. It is. It is scary for you know someone that's maybe been there five years, one year, maybe ten years or more. So you know family support, getting them involved as soon as they're incarcerated and then pre-release before they come home is, is of major importance. And this is a pilot program that, that Norfolk has been leading um, for the state, is that correct? Correct. The last six months, um, Norfolk Department of Human Services has been involved with a pilot program for family integration called Rebuilding Family Bridges. And it's, it was piloted out of the governor's office. And Norfolk Department of Human Services has collaborated with Norfolk Probation and Parole, Step Up, and a numerous other organizations in the city to help get this pilot off the ground. Um, our component of the program through Human Services is teaching of the Rebuilding Family Bridges, the curriculum that Norfolk Department of Human Services created and developed. So we're proud to say we have instituted it in five different um, Department of Corrections institutions, including two here locally, St. Brides and Indian Creek, and both of them are men's facilities, and we've done them in two female uh, um, institutions across the state and one, one other male facility as well. It's gone really well. The pilot has just ended, but we're hoping that we'll have the go-ahead to go ahead and put this out to other institutions around the state. And the curriculum gets the family involved at the same time that the participant inside the walls are taking the class at the same time. Oh, so okay. the family is taking it in the community and the participant is taking it while they're incarcerated. So then they can call each other, they can talk about what they're, what they're learning, and there's exercises that get them all interacted to kind of rebuild that bridge that they may have broken with their family because of distrust or um, the things that they've done in the past. So that's what we're trying to do is just get them reacquainted with, with each other to have that support when they get home. Well, the, um, so that 
you're actually giving them something in common to discuss and to get beyond the anger and the pain and the awkwardness and all those other things so that they can move forward together. Correct, and it's great that you said that because you said at the beginning of the segment, communication is key. That's the first chapter of the book is communication, and we take it for granted that we know how to communicate, <laughs> yeah. but oftentimes there's miscommunication, so we do communication and anger management and how to set healthy boundaries and what is a healthy relationship. So we've had really good success, and, and we really hope that this continues. I know I'm going to continue it no matter what. Um, I'm going to continue to teach it to the family members and those incarcerated in our local prisons and jails right now. Well, that's got to feel good when you've put a lot of work into something and you're starting to see people respond to it in a positive way. Correct. I mean, there's nothing better than that. There's also a, a peer support group meeting that is being started um, for family members and for those who are being released? Yes, we have a peer support that we have for those who are coming home from incarceration. And that's every Tuesday at 6 p.m. at the Workforce Development Center. Is that every Tuesday of the month? or Every, every Tuesday? Tuesday is for the participants coming home. Okay. But then the last Tuesday of the month, we open it up to family members so that they can come and see what their loved one is learning, who they're interacting with, and um, it's proven to be um, a great thing so far. So in the future, if we have enough, you know, uh, family members that get the word, you know, to come, we may open it up to every week, as you said. Okay. But right now, it's for the person coming home, and then the last one of the, of the month is for their family members. Okay. But it's open to the public. All right, great. We, we also have a family reunification seminar, and it's January 24th, 2014, at 6 p.m. at the Workforce Development Center. And myself and the probation officer from Norfolk State Probation, we welcome home people and talk about probation rules to their family members because if you can get the family members on board with their probation rules, maybe they'll be more successful on probation. And then we kind of orientate the families to all the services that Norfolk Department of Human Services provides. So it's a win-win situation. This past one was in October. We had over 65 attendees wow. of family members. So um, family support is is key. Okay, so that's January 24th at? At 6 p.m. 6 p.m. At, at the, the Workforce, Workforce Development, Development Center. Which room number is that? It is Three in three? 202 for that. 202, room 202. Okay. And our peer support, the last mm -hmm. one of the month, is for family. It's in room 303. <laughs> okay, so give us a call and we can tell you more. And thank you for, for sharing this great information about what's going on. Great, for I appreciate our, it. For our prisoners and the prisoner reentry program. Thank, thank you, you so much. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next time. Bye.